So yeah, if you want to, uh, please feel free to um, share. Um, I think if we don't have any sharing, my, my session might be pretty short. Um, I was actually inspired by last year's keynote um, and also Boston, where you know there's this interactivity that happens versus me just kind of spewing like all these ideas and, that I have. And I want to do it a little bit differently. Um, I wanted you guys to actually have the opportunity to interact. Um, so there's really uh, three activities that you'll see on this website. Uh, one is where you can share failures. And they're anonymous. No one's going to know who you are. Um, I'll be sharing my own so you'll know what a complete failure I am. Um, but there's also an opportunity to share successes, things that you're proud of. Um, I really I want to hear about and I want you to be able to share maybe a plugin that you've authored or maybe just a project you're proud of. Um, maybe it was a circumstance. You know, like for me, um, you know, I have a lot of successes and uh, I don't really tout them all that much. I'm actually as much of a loudmouth as I am. I'm actually pretty humble in that and I'm not a loudmouth braggart when it comes to the things I should, you know, be like really proud of. Um, and then also I'm gonna do a giveaway. I'm gonna have one question in here, and there's actually an area within that site where you can answer this one question. And uh, the person who answers uh, closest, without going over, uh, I'm gonna give away a one-year subscription to Jetpack Pro. Um, so Jetpack Pro, uh, for those of you that use Jetpack, think of all the awesome things it does, but with Jetpack Pro, you get automated like real-time backups, there's, uh, even more spam protection, you know, the, the, I think there's a hundred plus themes that are available for you to use, so if it's something that you're interested in, in your question, I don't want all of your contact information, just give your answer and your name. And I'm sure there's not going to be too many people that have the same exact name here today. Uh, so I'm pretty sure we'll figure out who it is. Uh, but, alright, so with all that out of the way, please interact. Um, Know this, it is a bit of the honor system, you know, uh, I'm doing a bit of, uh, you know, filtering to make sure there's no naughty words and things like that. Um, I do have some people that are helping me out moderate, so um, your messages will actually come up in due time, um, even though they're being pushed in like real time. Uh, and then that, that alright, so that bit of housekeeping done. Um, I just want to say thank you, uh, one, for attending my uh, session here but for Joy and Jesse, putting on an event like this. Um, Jesse was really involved a few years back and he asked me, you know, it was about two and a half, three years ago to get more involved in the community. And I took that as a challenge. And, you know, to see like this year where I wasn't really involved, yes, where Lynchpin is a sponsor here, but the team really volunteered, they really stepped up. And I didn't do a whole heck of a lot this year. Other than, you know, the Benjamins, you know, sponsor, but whatever. You know, but I want to really take the time to say thank you to all the volunteers. Thank you to everybody who just, you know, helped out in any little way that they could. And also thank you to Joy and Jesse for really, you know, leading the charge. It's not easy putting on one of these events. And especially, you know, in, in Rhode Island, it's, our community is really tight-knit. And, you know, it's, it just makes me happy. So thank you so much. Can I get a, a hand for Jesse and Joe? <laughs> All right, so Jesse did a great job. He introduced me. That's me in gray. This is my model shot. That's like my best photo like ever. <laughs> so I've been using it for years. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a business owner. I've owned Lynchpin for over 10 years now. Um, we're a digital agency and, you know, we're a really creative group and you know, we build a lot of things on top of WordPress. You know, whether it's plugins, whether it's Facebook apps, uh, whether it's, you know, the traditional website and blog. Yeah, we're known to do those things too. Um, and I'm a complete failure. All right, so my, my session is, you know, the big fail, and it's breaking down the fourth wall of agencies. Are you guys familiar with what the fourth wall is? So for the most part, uh, you guys are pretty familiar with it. I like to say that Shakespeare practically invented it. You know, when a character was having an aside, you know, and they wanted to step out of, out of the act, they would address the audience. And for a lot of, like, Shakespeare's work, um, it may have been a soliloquy, but it may have also been for a comedic result. 
And as a kid, I was actually introduced to it by this guy, Ferris Bueller. When he was getting ready for his day, you know, he was in the shower and he was talking about all the isms in life that he didn't really believe in. And this was my first foray into this. You know, there's more modern approaches to it, like Modern Family is one of them, but also The Office. Anytime the, uh, the characters in these mockumentaries were being interviewed, you know, they were actually breaking that fourth wall. They were addressing the interviewee versus addressing, you know, the audience. But the same idea applies. And uh, I don't know if it, where it started the loop. Uh, one of the more, uh, you know, funny ones that I like, but is a little bit more crass, is Deadpool. Uh, this movie and the comic in general actually makes heavy use of this, where uh, he pulls the user into, you know, just quirky things about what Marvel has going on versus what's really in his world. And uh, I'm going to be doing that today, which this is kind of fourth wall if you think about it, because I'm sitting there. And I'm now up here. It's... <laughs> so I don't know what it's going to look like when we're on camera. So with that, that fourth wall, I want to try and break that down a little bit today by sharing you know, failures and successes. And hot take number one, you know, as a society, we really fear failure. We, we fear you know, projecting weakness or even how we take a photo today. It's something that we worry about it being on the wrong angle. You know, we always want to present our perfect selves on all of these networks. And it's really because of one true fact. Failing sucks. It sucks. It makes you feel bad. You, you, you don't want to show other people that you may, you know, be vulnerable in, in that way. And, you know, without failure, though, how can we really learn? You know, how can we learn about... Even as kids, you know, we, we try and project, uh, protect our kids, especially myself being a, a pretty young dad with pretty young kids, you know, with like soccer, for example, like, you know, that's a, it's a tough thing. You try and develop, you know, your kids and you try to coach them. And it's a bummer if they don't win a game. It's a bummer if, you know, they don't score the goals that they want to or they don't stop a shot. Um, and for my daughter, it's, it's really hard. And it's one of those things that a lot of parents try and like protect their kids, you know? There's memes that go around about like the society now where every kid gets, you know, a participation trophy. And while, you know, politic uh, like politics aside on it, you know, I think there is something to developmentally having kids feel like they're encouraged to be there. Um, but also at the same token, sometimes adversity helps, you know? Like, how, how, how do we really learn about the challenges in life without having those adversities early on? And I think about sharing those adversities is, is really important. You know, it helps us with definitely with problem solving. You know, I, I would say that out of all the things that plugins I've written, themes I've developed, apps that have been created, I'm not the best developer. I fully admit it. I, I've probably been the least talented developer at Lynchpin for many years. But one thing that I am really good at is problem solving. And I understand how to get around issues and how to work around those challenges at all levels, whether it's development, whether it's, well, business development, whether it's pitching a client on what I think is the, you know, the best solution for them, um, or just the day-to-day how to pay the bills and things like that. You know, and with that, too many times, you know, many of us, we don't understand when we actually do something that really kicks ass and we should be actually proud of it and have success. And I think because we fear failing and we try to protect ourselves from that and have a bubble from it, a lot of us in this industry suffer from this, imposter syndrome, you know, where we're afraid to release something. We're, we're afraid to share our, our ideas. And when we actually have something that we really should be proud of, sometimes we bottle it up because we're worried that, oh my God, I think this is really cool, but how, what, what is Ryan gonna think? Because he, he knows a lot of stuff. Or, or what, what is this awesome agency gonna think? What is Imagine gonna think? Because they're huge and they're awesome and I really respect them, but what are they gonna think about this thing? And like. I find that I suffer from imposter syndrome a lot. You know, it's something that um, I try to be more open about it, but it's something that 
I think a lot of us, you know, have felt at some point in time. Like, raise your hand. Like, is there something that you have ever, like, felt or, or ever dealt with? You know, it's systemic. It, and it, it really comes down to that inability for us to, to be vulnerable and uh, to be proud, you know, of, of what, what we're doing. <coughs> you know, and, whoops. You know, so I said that, so sometimes we lose, uh, you know, we lose, we lose that uh, capability to, to share successes. And as service-based industries, you know, service-based service businesses and industries, we're really no better. We're actually worse about it. You know, as an agency, you know, we're supposed to know... Oh, what happened to my stuff? Uh, what happened here? Technical difficulties. I'll try and figure it out. What happened here? It takes adversity. On it takes adversity to figure out why this thing. What is it doing? Are you at the end of the slide? No, I'm not at the end of my slides. <laughs> Wait, did it come back? Oh, okay, cool. And we're back. See, adversity, we, we just problem solved it, we did it. Yeah, that's all you need. <laughs> IT support right there. All right. Why isn't I showing my phone? Because I walked all the way back and forth. There you go. No, I, no, it was. It was my slide. I failed on the slide. Right. Yeah, they All right. So uh, before I was uh, really interrupted by myself. All right. As an agency, we're supposed to know, but that's wrong. We're actually supposed to be experts in everything, you know? We're supposed to know every solution. We're supposed to know every patch. We're supposed to know every trend, every platform, every snippet of code. We are supposed to be the experts in things that we shouldn't even feel like we should be experts in. I've had clients uh, push back at us because we didn't know all of their entire product line of thousands of products, and we weren't experts in knowing what attributes should be shown, or how they should be configured, or how they should be displayed. And, you know, for us, that's kind of tough. We're put in this position where we have to be that expert all the time, and always be on. And I found that over time, it's actually a lot easier if you really share with clients, like, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and where you're willing to grow and expand. You know, this, you know, as an aside, you know, I wouldn't be doing as much Magento work had I was not given an opportunity by a client of ours. You know, they came to us and they really trusted all the WordPress work that we did years back. And they said, I want you to build us a new e-commerce setup. I said, cool, WooCommerce is like up and coming, it's gonna be great, you know, I'm really behind it, we know it really well, and they're like, no, we want you to work on Magento, which I probably shouldn't be mentioning Magento at a WordPress conference, but whatever. And it was that trust in them saying, we know that you can do it. You've been able to do it for us in another solution. You know, move over to that. And that little bit of vulnerability, you know, is, is something that I, I think has helped us. Um, you know, granted we are a bit smaller, but it's helped us along the way. But, you know, we are supposed to know all these things. And great agencies do. You know, there are agencies that are bigger than us that have you know, a ton of departments have a lot more heads than we do. You know, we average around eight to 10 people at Lynchpin, but I feel like the larger agencies do it a, a better job of being able to segment all of those um, expertises and making sure that they can work together to have a whole full-fledged solution. For us, we're very boutique -y. You know, and I struggle with this all the time. You know, we're just struggling to keep the house in order. We're, tr we're struggling to get our stuff out the door you know, we want to be on time, we want to be on budget, we want to turn a profit and, you know, move on to the next one. You know, it's the rinse and repeat. And it's something that, you know, as an agency owner, I fear I'm a failure and I'm failing just by staying in this cycle. You know, it's something where, for a smaller agency, you know, we don't have a huge sales team. You know, it's something that we always have to make sure that you know, we're, we're chasing that buck, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, as I said, ultimately life is full of failures. And it's these struggles that really define us overall. 
you know? And again, it feels awesome when you solve a problem or you overcome a challenge. And if life didn't have that, like, it would be super boring. You know, we would all just be kicking back and relaxing, drinking, you know, mojito and margarita, or just a bourbon. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, some more failure here. You know, 90% of startups fail. That's a pretty staggering number, you know, which, you know, that wasn't me, that's Forbes. You know, I, I'm, I'll share these slides, they're on slides.com, I'll share them. Yeah, that's a pretty staggering number. You know, 90% of businesses that start up fail. And I'm not talking like the tech startups of the world, I'm just talking any, any business owner that wants to start up, they fail. They go under. A lot of them are actually restaurants. Restaurants, that's a tough business to be in, and it, there is so much, you know, turnover in that industry. You know, all it takes is one episode of Shark Tank for you to realize that, you know, most of them should fail. <laughs> or not even start, like, at all. Like, they're just the craziest ideas. But the one thing that I learned from that show, and I don't watch it very often, but one thing I have learned is you really want to fail quickly and cheaply. <laughs> you know? if, if you're going to do it, you know, it's something that if you're going to fail, you know, at least, you know, Try not to sink too much money into it, too much time and effort. You know, but yeah, with that, you know, with that high number, that 90%, let's chop it down a little bit. Do you know that 80% of small businesses with employees survive that first year? You can kind of stumble and bumble and fumble through your first year as a startup. I'm proof of it. That first year was, you know, I saved up a ton of money. When I decided to really work on Lynchpin and just make it a thing, it was under a different name at the time, I saved up almost nearly $20,000 from my previous gig. I was doing side work, and I was freelancing, and I decided to make the jump. And I think I probably wouldn't have made it through the first year had I not saved up that money. I just made you know, poor decisions, not in spending, because you're a freelancer, it's one person. But those challenges that I had were really budgeting, really understanding when money's coming in, when it's going out, and really how to make sure that I was, you know, staying, you know, in the black versus, you know, going into the red. Fifty percent of them, you know, survive the, the fifth year that they've been open. That's where it really starts getting tough. You start making decisions about how you're going to grow, um, whether you're going to take a step back in whatever role it was, like an example being, I'm a developer at heart, you know, I'm a problem solver, and sometimes I even to this day have challenges with letting go of that. Even though I have such talented developers, sometimes I feel like I just I gotta be in there, I just gotta be like, I gotta, I gotta be in there doing my thing. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that I've been really fortunate where even with that, we've been able to grow over time. And sometimes businesses can't do that. They won't make it past that fifth year. Usually it's due to debt, you know, making payroll and, and benefits and all of those things. Less than 33% make it past 10 years. You know, so it actually, while there's a, there's a swoop that happens where it's a really high fail rate. And then kind of over time, you kind of hit this groove, you know, where less and less over time, like kind of once you make it to 10 years, I feel like it's that, I want to say make or break sort of year, but it's definitely something where it evens out a little bit and the challenges, you have enough experience in, in those challenges to know like, I'm really going to do this or finally just say like, nah, I'm, like I'm done, I don't want to do this thing anymore. You know, and Lynchpin, we're in that 33%. You know, we hit our 10 year anniversary last year. You know, and that's something that, you know, I've talked about fails here initially, but you know, I consider it a success. Like that's that's a successful thing, you know. Imagine, you know, they've been around since like 1996. That's awesome. That's something that I'm hoping, you know, Lynchpin as an organization, we get to that point where we're as big as Imagine, or we've been around as long, or to be known as industry experts in in, in their area. Like I want that. I think that, like Lynchpin right now for me is like we're kind of a medium fish in a small pond. You know, in terms of what I think of success, you know, you look at the ten ups of the world, or, or even the larger like big spaceship is another agency that I really respect. They're just so big to me. I'm like, like that that type of 
growth and that type of success, I can't even really fathom. It seems like so unobtainable. And you know, the, any of them that make it over that 10 year mark, it's just, it's, it's something to be proud of. But for those of us that haven't been around that long, the industry is still easy to get into. It really is. Obviously there's more opportunities now to get in at lower levels and to have less pressure. But there's still a lot of opportunity out there to, you know, get into this industry, especially with like New England Tech. You know, New England Tech, JWoo, URI to some extent, Salve, they all have pretty great programs nowadays for kids. Where when I started, there was nothing. You know, especially when, you know, Brett and Bill, who I, I go back to Imagine because, you know, they're just, I respect them a ton. And there was definitely no going to school back, back in 1996. It was learning and it was selling and pitching and doing the hard work, the brunt labor. And it wasn't about getting a degree then. I think when, when I actually was interested in getting a degree, one, I didn't have the work ethic. You know, that, that first and foremost, that's a big challenge. Or the capacity from a dollar standpoint to go to school. And I certainly wasn't into computer science. You know, that was really the field. If I wanted to get into the web, which I was into when I was a teenager, I really wasn't a computer scientist. Like, I wasn't going to open up C, and I wasn't going to write the next Minesweeper. I don't even know. Like. But I will say this. It is getting tougher and tougher to be successful. You know, it, it is. It, it is one of those things that, I guess it depends on what level of, what success means for you. But to me, I feel like, you know, doing the grind every day, I don't know if it's successful. I really don't know, going from project to project, I don't know if that's success. But really, success is whatever it means to you. That could be releasing a plug-in, it could be, you know, you know, becoming part of a team, it could be starting your own thing and being the owner, being the boss. But ultimately, you know, it comes down to creating something. And I've always loved this saying, where necessity is the mother of, inven of invention. I, and no one knows who said it. And I stumbled right through it. But there's also laziness is the father of invention. And to some extent, I, I agree with that. I'm a big person that I don't like busy work. I hate it. And I would rather automate things I can automate, put in a process that makes sense to get rid of that. It's actually something that Taylor from uh, our team at Lynchman, she's our project manager. And she's really helped revamp our process. We previously had process on top of process for the sake of process and more process. And she helped really streamline the things that we do. And you know, it's something that, for me, that's another success, that's another win. But I would say, knowing that, you know, <laughs> having you know, previously said necessity is the mother of invention and laziness is the father of invention, I like to say failure is the drunk uncle <laughs> of invention. <laughs> <laughs> By me, I quoted, you can, you heard it here first, I'm also pretty unknown, so even though those other authors are unknown, I'm pretty unknown too. And we've heard this one before, failure is not an option. You know, Gene Kranz, he was actually head of mission control for uh, the Apollo 13 mission. And for him, failure is not an option, you have lives on the line, and there's things that he really had to make sure his team worked on to make sure that, you know, those astronauts, you know, came home safely. But for us, failure is not optimal. It's something where, you know, most of the time, I'll say this, you know, our lives aren't on the line. If a site doesn't go well, if a project doesn't go well, our, you know, we're not just going to just evaporate and we're not going to go into the vacuum of outer space, it's, you know, we're going to, um, maybe our livelihoods will be affected, which is still pretty monumental, but overall we don't have to necessarily worry too much about those failures, because they're going to happen. And honestly, I believe in this heavily also because of Ben Franklin, Ben, Mother F. and Franklin, which I would say, uh, say is, you know, do not fear mistakes. You will know failure. Continue to reach out. Ben Franklin is, honestly, he's my, like, he's my gin. He's like my favorite historical figure ever. The dude was awesome. And speaking of my man, Ben Franklin, 
Did you know that Ben Franklin invented a new alphabet? That's pretty crazy. I, I couldn't believe it when I was reading about it, you know, years back. It's called the phonetic alphabet. An utterly awesome failure. It's super cool by Miriam Webster. He was a fan. Notice the K. Wait, what? So the whole idea behind it was Ben Franklin thought, there's too many redundant characters. If I have the letter C, why can't I just use the letter K? And if I have the letter W, why can't I use another sound? Same thing with J. I don't know how we understood to get from W and J, because I feel like those are really important letters. But Ben Franklin, he's, he's got one up on me. And uh, he wanted to add in new characters for like TH sounds and things like that. Obviously, it did not catch on. We're not using it today. But, you know, I, I find that we're not, we don't really know Ben Franklin for the phonetic alphabet. You know, we know him for, obviously, the kite and all those things. And I feel like the, I'm totally quote-heavy in this keynote, but I like to think of it as something that Mitch Hedberg used to say uh, before he passed away. Is One of his punchlines was, you know, all of, you can't please all the people all the time. And last night, all those people were at my show. <laughs> and it's something that I, I always love this quote. And so that, actually, another Mitch that's in, in the crowd uh, likes to quote. And uh, maybe I have a little bit of that here, too, in the keynote. You know, but to Ben, you know, I'll reference him again pretty much a million times all the time in my life. So it's a failure, but he got over it pretty quick. You know, he had a ton of failed businesses too. Even with all his successes as, as a printer, you know, he like basically revolutionized the, uh, the, the actual postal industry as we know it, even though it's had some trouble since. But, you know, he's done a lot of cool things. Um, but, you know, with that, he just moved on, carried on. He said, all right, cool, I gotta go to the next thing. So sharing time. So uh, I'm gonna share uh, probably the hardest part of being um, a business owner. I'm also going to share um, probably the biggest failure I've ever actually had as a business owner. So, to me, the hardest part of agency life is this. No matter what, everything we do is driven by by money. There's no matter what, we have to we. Like, to me, I don't pay my employees. I don't. Our clients do. So it's, it's imperative for us to make sure that the clients we have are always happy. You know? And we're not going to please all the people all the time. You know? But we got to make sure that not all of our clients that we have currently are pissed off. But you know, we have these challenges of money in, money out. You know, we got to <coughs> acquire new work. And we gotta, we gotta be always projecting workload. So yeah, we gotta get new work in, but we have all this other stuff. We have staffing we have to worry about, balancing income and current, incoming work and that, that current work. On top of that, making sure that payroll is met, making sure that you know, benefits that we provide to our employees are there, the other HR things. And then upselling the services. So now that we've created this awesome solution, we want to make sure that you're still with us and we're still working hard for you and you trust in us and maybe we get some sort of retainer. But we're always selling, 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 pitching, pitching, pitching. And uh, not to mention just the day-to-day -day business thing. Actually doing the work, getting the work done, organizing what's happening. These are all things that you know really do revolve around money because they're all scheduling. For us as a service-based business, um, time Time rules all because that's all billable dollars. We're no different than a lawyer or an accountant. The thing is, with, with our industry though, typically you're not really haggling all that much with your lawyer. You're not really haggling all that much with your accountant. And even though those are services, for some odd reason, we still to this day, even though the world would not exist in the way that we know it without the internet, we're still like the like the penny pinch, like we always have like clients that want like $60,000 worth of work for $6,000 or for a freelancer it's $6,000 worth of work for 600 you know it's like that thing that 
to me infuriates me because I'm like, oh, we're awesome and we're worth every penny and we'll prove it and we can do these things. And, but it's the part that I really hate the most. And I like to call it the, uh, the tip of the spear when it comes to sales. You know, I'm a pretty good closer. I don't get really nervous, so that really helps. Um, but, you know, I'm a schmoozer. I'm not a salesperson at all. Like, I'll go and I'll have a beer. I'll talk to anybody in the happiness bar. You can come up and say, hey. And the reason why I know I'm not a great salesperson, I am terrible with names. Like, I do it all the time. I'm sure most of you say, like, Aaron never remembers my name. And it's something that I know that maybe that's why I'm not such a great sales guy. I'm really more of a schmoozer. You know, <laughs> you know, ask my friends, you know, people that are here in this very room, you know, one of the things that you'll know about me is I'm never going to call you, even as a friend, I'm never going to call you. If you're going to text me, um, I might text back, I might, but I'm going to, if, if I'm with you and we're like hanging out, like that's cool, I'm like right there, I'm in, I'm in the moment. And I think you really need that for a salesperson. You think about it. I've owned a business for over 10 years now. And I'm really the worst salesperson there is. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm just not very good at it. Um, and I don't call people back, so you would think that we would have no work whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what would we do? Anyway, I hate it. Because I have to do it. And I want to share with you the worst fail that I've ever had. And I'm not talking about just calling someone back. So after working as a team, you know, we have something, and, and I'm, I'm going to just like say it a lot. Like, I, Brett Cohen, who is part of Imagine, he's one of the founders, he's a mentor to me. You know, when Jesse was, you know, he, he said it so eloquently. He talked about me being a mentor for him. You know, something that um, Brett shared with me was, Something that never really occurred to me is, Aaron, your acquisition cost for your what you want to do, like what projects you want to get, is actually really low. You know, people are basically finding you. They're stumbling into you. Yeah, you're doing a word camp or you're sponsoring or something like that. But really, you're not going out. You're not spending money on advertising. You're not spending money on travel. So those acquisition costs themselves are really low. And the projects that you get, probably aren't going to be as, you know, high, you know, lucratively because really your acquisition costs are so low. But at this point in time with this specific scenario, we actually had a pretty high acquisition cost for a potential project. So after working 120 collective hours as a team on a proposal, a proposal for almost $200,000, it was a little over $200,000. Um, it was really our best proposal ever. I really say that to this day, we wrote the best proposal ever that the prospect actually never even saw. And to me, I actually still to this day, I, I'm at my, uh, I don't keep it at the office, but at my home office on my desk, I keep it there as a reminder every day of that failure. So I just know that I'm reminded and I will never forget it. It's something that still like upsets me to this day. Like even just talking about it now, I'm like, ooh, I'm really, really personal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was something. It was our highest acquisition cost ever. If I just did simple math and just said, oh, it's $100 an hour and you spend 120 hours on it, you know, you get $1,200. But then also, we had printing of proposals. In the requirement for the proposal was basically like, six copies, six hard copies of the proposal. And we said, wait, you know, we're a creative agency. We kick ass at design. We want to show them. So we did a rush job printing it at the last minute. You know, I want to say the last minute because I'll get to that. Where we had it printed, cost nearly $1,000 just for the assets, just to pitch our proposal. So for us, that's a high acquisition cost. You go from basically having leads fall in your lap to actually having one we did chase. We got to the point of doing an actual proposal, had great conversations. And to have that acquisition cost um, was a tough pill to swallow at first. We said, like, hey, no, I'm going to do this. I think it's a good idea. I think we need this. This is going to, like, nail it. It's going to drive it home. So we get everything ready, everything's printed, we're ready to go, we have all these requirements. We even have a nice little care package that says like, 
hey, here's a bunch of stuff from Lynchpin. It had like shirts in it and like get, get to know us. But I had a great idea. I had a Ben Franklin level idea. It was monumental. <laughs> you know what? I'll drop it off in person. I want to actually get this in their hands because we've had multiple phone conversations. We've had uh, all this work. I feel like it, it's imperative that we get it to them on, on, you know, in their hands. And to me, them, like here, I'm the owner. You know, I'm involved in the project. My team's really excited. And the thing I didn't, I planned on, and I left early. But hopefully it loads. Hopefully I'm muted. I hate this. Yeah, that's not really me. Reason <laughs> But I hit that. I kid you not, I left almost two hours early to make sure I had plenty of time so I could actually drop off the proposal and maybe actually go grab a bite to eat. But I missed the cutoff for submission. For this project, it was something where there was a rigid cutoff. I called them, I pleaded, I said, I am on my way, but there is nothing. There is, I can do nothing. I literally cannot. I can't get off. I can't take an exit. I am stuck. I am going zero, sometimes one, you know? And I missed it. So quiz time. <laughs> so uh, I, I shared a site. Uh, I should actually put it on this slide, but uh, theware.house uh, slash jeopardy. Um, if you want to, you can submit, I missed the time. In how many minutes did I miss the cutoff by? <laughs> the person that answers this closest without going over, again, in minutes, um, you'll get that year subscription to Jetpack Pro. I'm going to give you a minute while I get a drink of water. It may not be a minute, but maybe like 30 seconds for anybody that wants to. <coughs> Max, if you want, you can like publish the guesses if you want. If anybody does guess, mm -hmm. we'll show up. Hopefully they do. Go to the where dot house slash jeopardy. What'd you get? No house is uh, like dot com. No, the where dot house. Yeah, that's what I said. The where, the house, the, I got like the Asian script. No, 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 there's no rap pop. No, she's like that guy. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, I see. Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Were there any in there? Did anybody guess? They're not coming up. How dare you? Yeah, nothing, nothing happened. You guess. Oh, oh, man. Nothing happened. Fail vote. Oh, they're coming up. We could submit it on the failure. And no, wait, hold on. Hold on here. Wait, hold on. Oh, man, technical difficulties. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay, so they are coming up. They're just taking a little while. All right, cool. This was supposed to be way more, like, grandiose and, like, not be cut off. But, uh, all right. Well, I like some of these picks. Oh, yeah. Mine's not working. Yours isn't working? Well, you tried to go to like where.house.com. Right okay. Right oh, so we have some people that it's, you know, some it's not. Oh man, I love this. You get the message at the bottom, huh? No, there's no Oh man. I may have actually given the answer. I think I may have, like, in my haste, I may have, like, actually said what it was. Oh man, I'm gonna give it like 30 more yeah, seconds. It's not going? No. Just the Jeopardy one, the other one worked. Right. Yeah, the oh, other okay. one worked. Oh, it's weird. It's, for some people, it's working. Oh, all right. All right, well. All right, well. Ooh, there's some good answers. I like that. All right. Where? So, I'm gonna, I was gonna be anonymous, but I was, someone put an anonymous guess in there. Like Bonnie, five minutes. Okay. So what's your guess? I'll, I'll let you guess. I put five. Five? Yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? Whoever, whoever couldn't, just yell them out. Two. Three. Three. Five. 
Sixteen. Twenty-four. Eight, one and a half. Wow. Oh, there was another eight. Okay. So, eight minutes. That's really good. All right. Who? <laughs> what's your name? Karen. Karen. <laughs> too many minutes, Max. That's right. The answer was Max, which was too many minutes. I missed it. <laughs> but, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Karen. Karen. Karen was the closest without going over. It was nine minutes. I submit, was there another eight minute up there? Oh, it is, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll cover both of them. So whoever did that what is eight minutes that had the Jeopardy format that was correct, uh, I'll take care of you too, just hang out. All right, so it was nine minutes. I missed that opportunity by nine minutes, and I know in my heart, I know with every fiber of my being, we would have won it. Not because of the tip of the spear, honestly, because I know I could have closed it. And that's the damnedest thing. Like, and that's why I remind myself every day about it. You know, I walk by that desk. I may not sit there every day, but I walk by it and I see it. So with that, you know, you gotta learn something. You gotta grow from it. You know, really, the only thing that I, I realized that I learned from it was punctuality matters. And it doesn't really matter to that prospect. We, right away, even if I would have pleaded and really begged and cried and said, we need this job, like we'll go under if we don't get this job. That wouldn't have put us in a right position, you know, with, with them anyway. You know, they wouldn't have been confident in what we were gonna do. And, you know, to this day, it's punctuality matters. And Max was joking, but it's right. You know, the, you know I missed it by too many minutes. Could have missed it by 30 seconds. You know, it wouldn't have mattered. So, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a downer. That's a bummer. I brought everybody down. You know, we were all... <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was, it, was all, it was all going swimmingly, and then Aaron went off the rails. <laughs> but, you know, with that, it, it's really, again, it's not about that failure. It's about learning from it. And also turning failure into success. So uh, another thing that I'd like you to be able to do is uh, let's fail together for a few minutes here because I'm going to go into some other stuff. If you're willing, and maybe you already have, I'd like you to share some fails. They'll pop up. You know, we can go through them. Uh, they're anonymous unless you shared your name if you wanted to. Um, but let's do it. It didn't go? What's going on? I tested the bejesus out of this. No, it worked. It worked. <laughs> Must have some. It's uh, getting hostile error saying uh, too many requests. Oh, they cut me off. Uh -huh. I got cut off. Oh, man. I guess I didn't test how many people would be connected. I should have done siege testing and really. I should have really tested it under real live load. So we won't let the first few people come on. Well, that's a bummer. All right, well, I mean, I wanted to be so cool here. Hold on one second. Hold on. Bear with me. Again, we're going to problem solve this. I don't know which ones are going to show up here. All right. Oh, man. Forget it. Max, just read them off. Let's just read them off then. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not showing. What am I supposed to do? Help me solve this problem. Aaron, is there a way to switch to the view that Max has? No, because that's a, like a WordPress admin. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, they'll be anonymous. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let me do it. I'll do it. That's a good point. Yeah, Jesse. Uh, all right. Yeah, he's mentoring me through this process. All right, so there's a bunch that have been approved here, so I'm going to go to those, and then... Oh, man. Ugly, ugly. But I can't even read them up here. All right, I'm just going to have to go through them. Oh, here's all my, here's all my guesses. You weren't supposed to see my, my dirty laundry. <laughs> They're impending? Oh, yeah, no. Oh, why I have this behind it? Holy jeez, I love it. Why you guys? All right, so uh, they're all commenters, so there you go. So uh, let's just start at the top. 
So I forgot to change the email address on a lead collection form. The client didn't notice for nearly two months. Effectively threw 500 leads in the trash. Oh. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. I've done it. Maybe not that bad, but I've done that before. We actually, um, what we did for a while was actually leads that came in through the site. Uh, we actually had them go into just a general bucket for like that client so they would come in so we'd have some sort of like catch-all. Um, another thing you can think about for that person, um, think about a solution like Gravity Forms or something like that where it actually can store entries within the site so even though the notifications didn't go out, you know, you can, you know, still have access to it. I once presented a talk at South by Southwest that was supposed to be live and interactive, but I had too many requests. Oh, <laughs> man, I just told, you totally just did like a, what's it, Ron Burgundy to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, man, we got these other ones that are supposed to be moderated, so you're, gonna, you're seeing some here that we wouldn't see like test. Hey, too much pizza. Uh, so someone actually, so I like this one. So wasted an entire spool of negatives for a, print, a printing press and I forgot to invert the colors for 70-ish pages, you know? So it's not really in our industry, but that's a tough, it's a tough one to, to uh, put in there. After getting more responsibility at work but no promotion, I went to my boss and asked for a big fancy title and lots of money. It was a strategic play to get better but less impressive title and half the money. I ended up getting everything I asked for. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough one. That's, that's tough too. Stuck with the status quo, and it was uh, familiar and comfortable. Uh, let's see. Oh wait, these are some positive ones too. Okay, sorry, that was a success. Oh, they're all mixed in. All right, they're all mixed in because you weren't supposed to see like behind yeah. the scenes. Like, yeah. This is like Oz. I just pulled back the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you just see me back there. I'm like on a plate. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a good one, uh, even though I'm going to get to successes, but let's just do it. You know, started my website today at WordCamp RI. That's awesome. Uh, hopefully you learned a ton from Lydia's class. She, she knows her stuff. You know, <laughs> oh, man, that's a success. I love this one. I learned the hell out of Flash and got really good at it. <laughs> but is that a fail now? <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that, like, I, I could have written... Oh, cool. Yeah, because I, I can attest to that. I was awesome at Flash. I loved it. When Steve Jobs said, like, yeah, no more Flash. My phone is awesome. You're, you're not getting Flash anymore. I was really bummed. Like, I was like, oh, man, but like Flash is like so cool. And I can do such cool things. Just ignore all the security vulnerabilities. And have, <laughs> it'll totally hijack your processor. And, you know, and I, ooh, I got like five minutes here. Uh, so, uh, let's just keep going. I love these. Um, and then I'll do like two or three more and then I'll actually go to like a success from failure. I was given a chance to prove myself. Oh, I, uh, hold on here. Uh, let's, uh, not recognize. Oh, I like this. So this is a failure. Not recognizing my successes. And that's something I mentioned. I, ho I hope that you recognize your successes more. I, I, if anything, um, I, hope, I hope you see that. Oh, this is a good one. Helped us help to successfully organize the first niche WordCamp uh, WordCamp for publishers. I know who that was. It's anonymous here, but it's really it was really Taylor and Ryan. That's a that's a good that's a that's a good one. I actually have one, but one of mine I don't know where it was. I'm going to be really selfish. Oh, this is a really good one. Being credited for a version of WordPress. That's an awesome one. That's a great accomplishment. And you know, honestly, everybody in this room right now could actually get involved in that. It's actually pretty easy to become a contributor. They, they actually, the documentation that is there, uh, people like uh, John DeRogers, who's, who's in the crowd, who's actively involved in that community, um, they're really encouraging. And they'll even guide you on, like if you're a developer and you want to fix your first bug, there's a great list in, in track to actually get you going on that. And you can help out in other ways, whether it's like the polyglot team and doing translations. There's a ton of ways to be involved in that. So that's awesome, being credited. Um, I have a fail. I one time uh, committed to the WordPress.org repo, the plugin repo. Uh, a change automatically happened within my editor. It was for um, uh, just a minor change. I did like a minor localization change. 
and I pushed it out uh, to WordPress.org. Everything worked on our stuff, worked great. It inadvertently converted arrays to like brackets and it broke every, uh, anybody who updated the plugin, which it would, you know, you get all these prompts update plugins. Uh, if they were on WordPress uh, PHP 5.3, it actually white screened their sites. Ooh, ooh, ouch, ouch. Which I would say, stage and test any change that you, you have on your site, so you're not doing it live on production. But it probably shouldn't have gone out in the first place. So, ugh. <laughs> but I'm going to end with this. I got a couple of minutes left here. Let's get this thing out of the way. Oh man, my interactive thing was all fail boat. That's what I'm going to. That's what I'm going to take home from this. Like test more. <laughs> all right. So let's get this out of here. All right. How many of you use Slack? It's a it's a large portion. Of it. Yeah, others use like HipChat or like whatever Basecamp was that they had. But anyway. Uh, this is another hot take. I should have had my hot take, like, you know, slide before this. Slack uh, founder and CTO, Cal Henderson, he could not make video games. He just can't do it. He's awful at it. He's tried it numerous times. But he and his team have made the best chat app since, since AOL. I, I submit that there's never been one better since then. And, you know, he, he also worked on Flickr. And, uh, he worked, at, he worked on Flickr and became part of that team to help fund a video game that him and three of his friends were trying to make. He was really passionate about video games and he really wanted to make a game. And he, the game wasn't making any money, so he actually had to get a side, a side job. And he started working at Flickr. Flickr blew up. You know, so after you know, four years of working on like, Flickr and whatnot, four years of working at Yahoo, you know, he decided, okay, it blew up, I actually have some cash now. I'm gonna do it again, I'm gonna try and make a video game. So, you know, fast forward four years after working at Yahoo, he started making another game with probably the same group of friends, maybe some new people, and that game didn't take off either. But during that time, he had actually been working on Slack, as it was known then, just as an internal communication tool. It was something that he was solving a problem internally that all of a sudden, you know, this happened. Slack blew up. And uh, no more games. I mean, at that point, you kind of realize that you've now had two incredibly successful properties that you've been a part of, and video games weren't one of them. As passionate as he was, he failed at it all the time. And uh, I think that's something that, you know, if you're working on something and it doesn't feel like it's going to be, you know, your passion, you know, it's tough, you know, when you feel like, oh, okay, I'm really passionate about video games. Like, I'm really passionate about creative work that we do. But sometimes I think about, maybe I should make a plugin. Maybe, maybe that's something that's more scalable. And I kind of feel like he had that same thing, too. He, he thought about the things that he was making for the games, and he thought about how those things could apply in other ways. And that's something I start to think about more. So maybe I'm getting out of that cycle of saying, Okay, rinse and repeat, get the new job. What are other ways, at a, as a business owner, we can have if, like revenue come in and maybe not always have to be chasing, the, chasing that dollar? Um, but that's it. That's all I got. I went right to the wire. I didn't realize that I was going to go right to the end. I thought I was going to have time for questions. But I'm going to be hanging out. I'll be at the after party at the soiree. Um, I would encourage you to come talk to me. Again, I'm a schmoozer. So like, say hi. <laughs> Um, if I, uh, if I've forgotten your name, I'm a total jerk and I admit it, um, and I will try and be better, and I will try and work at it, I'll try not fail at, at remembering names. Um, but, um, I'll leave you with this. It's, it's a thank you, and I appreciate, uh, you know, you let me gab up here, and one more success from failure. Bubble wrap. <laughs> Did you know that bubble wrap used to be for wallpaper? It used to be a, it was going to be a fancy wallpaper. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know until I started this slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you. I appreciate the talk.